Hey everybody, welcome back to yet another Lifespan.io Journal Club presentation. I'm Dr. Oliver Medvedic, and uh, just to remind myself so I don't forget to mention it, we have a conference coming up, isn't that right, Steve? The Ending Age-Related Disease Conference, sixth annual here in New York City. I think it's the Bowery, Bowery Ballroom, is that the correct address? It, it is the uh, the Bowery Building. Bowery uh, Building. The, sorry, it's on Bowery, sorry, um, and it used to be a bank, it's the capital. Capitale building, I think that's Capitale. how you pronounce it, okay. and it's quite iconic in New York, uh, as you may confirm, I don't mm -hmm. know. I understand that it was originally a uh, a bank, um, and the irony of us hosting a longevity, DeSci, and blockchain cryptocurrency event there is not lost on me, in a former bank. But it, it is, I understand, been used for as a ballroom, uh, a grand ballroom in New York now for Ooh, about a decade or so. Mm -hmm. So it, it's a beautiful building. It's all Art Deco with a massive glass ceiling, and it's it's fab. It's one of those sort of Art Deco buildings, or no, sorry, it's not. It's neoclassical, and it's beautiful. So we are returning to New York City. Um, if you can't make it to the conference, we're also doing um, virtual tickets too. So it's a it's a, an online and physical event because we we want. Uh, more people to be getting involved if they wish to and we've got loads of speakers so do check it out on our website and you can find out more by just going to lifespan.io forward slash conference or you can also use forward slash e-a-r-d erd and that will get you to the relevant stuff and we've got three more days at the early discount rate so if you'd like to join us cheaper on the physical tickets uh, Check it out. Anyway, um, that is enough of a plug, I think. Yep. Uh, one other, other plug uh, is uh, August 10th and 11th, I believe. Those are the dates. And yes. um, and uh, apropos to this paper and the conference, one of the co-authors, Dr. Vadim Gladyshev, will be speaking at the conference, I believe. He's got where we've locked him in. So um, he is on the paper that we are going to be covering um, right now at the Journal Club. So what is this paper? So, um, so this paper kind of bookends the paper we did, like, over a year ago, which was um, looking at somatic cell mutation rates in mammals and how they trend and track and basically correlate with rates of aging. Um, so the paper we're doing now, um, it's a bioarchive paper, so I believe it hasn't been peer reviewed yet. I don't think it's, they're still um, working on some additional data. Uh, it's, the paper is DNA here it is, DNA repair and anti-cancer mechanisms in the longest living mammal, the bowhead whale. Um, so very interesting from a number of perspectives. So uh, in this paper, um, there's a number of names, so Fiersinov et al. Um, and of course, I mentioned Dr. Vadim Gladyshev, um, who I believe uh, took part in um, designing a number of these experiments here, and also Vera Gorbanova, um, those of you who recognize the name know that she is basically famous for being an expert in the longevity studies related to naked mole rats. Uh, so a number of authors here, um, and I think it's pretty cool that they're looking at a, an organism that normally, well, normally isn't looked at. You don't usually look at, you, you look at short-lived organisms typically in aging research for you know obvious reasons. If you're looking at lifespan analyses, you're not gonna look at an organism that lives 200 plus years, which is, I think, the maybe the maximal. I don't know what the maximal longevity of the bowhead whale is, but certainly they've been they've been calculated to live 200 plus years through a number of interesting mechanisms that they posit in the paper. Um, from looking at um, at the molecular level, I think they look at amino acid um, racemization. So amino acids come in one-handedness um, in biological systems, and uh, if they're deposited in Long-lived tissues such as such as teeth, for example, um, they will tend to uh, convert into you know both equal mixtures of an L and D and antimers, and then you could use that as a, that ratio to track the longevity of an organism, which I believe they use that to figure out how long bowhead whales live, as well as a number of interesting anthropological measures such as finding whales that had harpoons stuck in them from the Victorian era, and then you could you could figure out that this this whale is pretty old. Uh, so let me stop sharing here and let me pull up. Um, oops, let me pull up uh, my PowerPoint here. Let's 
So this is a paper that we looked at. Um, well, this paper came out uh, 13th of April, 2022. So we probably reviewed it shortly thereafter. Um, Mike, I think you were on this journal club when we looked at this this paper, somatic mutation rates scale with lifespan across mammals, Kagan et al. Um, and I don't think they looked at bowhead whales, but they looked at um, dogs, humans, mice, naked mole rats. Um, and essentially what they showed was that the mutation rate uh, correlates um, if in somatic cells. And they looked at uh, intestinal crypt cells in this paper. Um, scales uh, or matches essentially the longevity, maximal longevity of various organisms um, pretty closely. I forgot how strong the correlation was, but it was pretty tight. Uh, so something is obviously controlling the rate at which these somatic mutations occur and are basically ameliorated. And this paper here uh, does just that for the bowhead whale. So let me, oops. Was I not sharing my screen? That is correct. Oh, okay. Um, okay. <laughs> uh, please let me know if I'm not sharing it. Sometimes I get a. All right, there we go. This paper here. So Kagan et al. So I think some of you are on this paper. So this was the figure that I was alluding to when I was jabbering away with uh, just just me talking. Um, so basically. Um, the somatic mutation rates um, vary and are proportional to um, the maximal lifespan of the organism. Um, although they tend to accumulate the same burden at the end of their lifespan um, per the size of their genome, uh, the rates though, um, uh, the rates that are faster um, and slower co are correlated directly uh, to, uh, or inversely correlated to uh, lifespan. So, um, and stop sharing here. So that brings us to this bowhead whale paper. So it's an interesting paper. Um, there's maybe a couple of little glitches here and there because um, it uh, still hasn't been reviewed yet. I think they're still working on. Uh, we cannot fix this in the dub, I'm afraid, Oliver. I don't know what that relates to, but okay. <laughs> um, so let's go back to the paper here. Okay. So I'm going to scroll down because um, it's in this format. It's bioarchive format. Um, da, 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 da. Figures are all the way back here. Pass the references. There we go. OK, so figure one. Uh, so what do they look at figure one? Uh, so let me just zoom this out a little bit. Hopefully you can all see this. Um, so uh, not surprisingly, so we haven't gotten to the meat of the paper yet here. So they look at bowhead whale fibroblasts and they look at fibroblasts from a number of organisms, mice, cows, humans, whales that all have different maximal lifespans. Obviously mice the shortest, uh, these bowhead whales the longest. Um, despite being very long lived, they still exhibit senescence. Um, so uh, just like humans, most of the tissues in the bowhead whale don't um, express telomerase. Uh, if you express, uh, no, in this case, they expressed also human telomerase in bowhead whales, you can basically uh, re-extend their population doublings. So they do undergo senescence. Um, so uh, unlike some other cells, so HeLa cells, so this is in B, so they do a telomerase assay here showing that, um, so interestingly mice, which is extremely short lived, has very, um, very active. Um, so this is, I believe a trap assay, which is looking at telomere extension. So activity of uh, telomerase. So humans and whales tend to have a lot of um, telomerase shut down in their tissues. So in most of their tissues, I believe are, you know, um, not expressing uh, telomerase as opposed to HeLa cells. And interestingly, mice cells, they have very long telomeres, so very active telomerase. Although that doesn't correlate with lifespan. Um, and this is another telomerase assay. So this is basically showing that, you know, there's nothing that, you know, despite their long lived longevity, they still have, their, you know, they still undergo t telomere attrition. Um, you know, they haven't really, in these figures, I don't think there's really a, you know, um, 
very tight calculation. Uh, it looks like there might be, you know, slower telomere, you know, slower population doublings taking place. Um, I don't know if the telomere attrition is slower. You know, I, it's hard to kind of figure out from this figure here. This is a southern blot, so looks like humans start with slightly shorter telomeres, you know, longer in the whale. But again, that's not really mentioned in the paper. The only thing, you know, that's mentioned here is that uh, just like human cells, they undergo telomere attrition. Um, you know, if you want to chime in and jump in and, and if there's something that pops out at you, feel free to, you know, feel free to comment. But those are the comments amongst the authors and the papers. So um, I'm not going to attempt to, you know, extrapolate anything else that the authors hadn't, although I did, you know, look at this and say, hey, looks like the human, human telomeres are on average shorter to begin with, with, with humans. But um, I don't know if that's a, a correlation with, you know, the extra longevity of the whale. The focus of the paper here is uh, increased capability of DNA repair. Um, the cells also senesce, so they subject these cells um, to various dosages of ionizing radiation, which induces double-stranded double breaks, 10 grays, 20 grays. Uh, RS, I'm not sure. Um, there's a couple of things in the paper where I, I can't seem to find certain, um, uh, need to edit it a little bit, I think. Uh, there are certain uh, abbreviations that kind of aren't mentioned, and I had to actually go out of the paper to find them <laughs> to fill in the blanks. Uh, but it looks like uh, the cell still senesce, so this is uh, staining with um, beta galactosidase, which is a marker of senescent cells. Um, so they show that you know it doesn't appear to be um, well. Here's the here's the um, quantification of of these figures here. Uh, the cells also undergo similar apoptotic rates. The only thing that's different is when they look at a variety of different um, factors that are associated with uh, senescence-associated secretory phenotype, so inflammatory markers um, such as IL-6, for example, and IGF. Uh, they tend to be, so this is a log scale for um, uh, human and bowhead whale, BW bowhead whale, on these two axes, um, they tend to be lower, um, lower for the bowhead whale. So, you know, um, so that's a comment that the authors have made, that despite all these other similarities with, with the bowhead whale, um, when it comes to senescence, when it comes to uh, undergoing um, telomere attrition. Um, the one difference that they found after you know doing these experiments that are shown in uh, figure one uh, is that you have lower amounts of senescence associated secretory phenotype um, factors that are released but otherwise there's there appears to be similarity up to this point. So I'm going to stop sharing here before I move on to figure two. So nothing, nothing too radical here, nothing that really kind of pops out too much uh, as to point towards the extra longevity of the bowhead whale, which they'll get to later. So anybody have any comments or thoughts thus far? Anything that could be additional data pulled out from that figure? Um, it, if I understand correctly, this first figure is basically just trying to show we don't think it's all these things because they're so similar, more or less. Yeah, that's basically it. Um, you know, there's there's certain things that you know, like I made a little a little comment there, like you know, um, you, we could do a little bit more quantifiable um, measuring with you know telomere attrition rates and telomere lengths with bowhead whales. Um, you know, that figure it was just that one figure, um, but it's kind of hard. You know, it's hard to. Um, I don't know how representative that figure is, you know, whoops, uh, how representative this figure is in this assay. So this is basically your telomere length staining, and you can see these are the population doublings, 10, 33, 48. This is 40, 67. So mm, we'd have to have more, more I think, gels um, and more, more data points here to kind of figure out rates and see if there's any kind of correlation with telomerase activity. Um, but basically, you could just qualitatively say that, you know, that just like humans, you have telomere attrition happening in bowhead whales. 
you know why for the PP53 chart uh, G down there, they chose cow? It feels why did the they think for the and why cow for G and H? Um, good question. It's probably because its uh, lifespan is probably somewhere between um, mouse and human. How long does a cow live anyway? I have no idea. Longer than a mouse. Longer than a mouse, shorter than a whale, shorter than a human. <laughs> yeah. Uh, it just, uh, anytime someone uses a non-standard animal, I don't know, maybe a cow is a standard animal here. Uh, it always makes me wonder a little bit why they chose that animal. Was it cherry-picked for some reason, or is it just, you know, happen to have certain features? If so, what are those features that are of interest? Yeah, I'm not sure. Um, interestingly here, like, for example, um, I know why NMR was picked. Can anybody guess what NMR stands for? Make it more right? Yeah, you got it. I, it took me a while. I couldn't find it. It wasn't mentioned in the paper. I was, it wasn't, I'm like, what is NMR? Uh, I'm like, I'm, and, and then of course, Vera Gorbanova. I'm like, wait a minute. <laughs> um, <laughs> naked mole rat. Yeah. yeah. So, so they don't know what a Gila is though. Uh, it's, uh, so these are, um, tumor cells, um, from a woman who passed away in the fifties, a famous book written, um, uh, it's, uh, her name is Henrietta Lacks. So that's, that's the abbreviation of her name. So in the 1950s, it was a kind of one of the first cell lines that was, um, isolated, um, from her tumor. Um, she passed away, unfortunately. Um, and I believe there's a famous book called something to the effect of the immortal life of Henrietta Lacks, um, who lives on in these cell lines, these cancer cell lines that are used, uh, quite extensively in labs across the world. Um, I, I don't want to go off too much on a tangent on that, but how confident are we that after all this time, these cells are still representative of the original set? Not, not confident. Sure not confident at all. There's been there's been many okay. reviews, many many reviews written about um, people have known for a long time, and going back to at least when I was an undergrad in the '90s, people you know talking about how um, you know passaging these cells and any other tumor cell lines um, that they're not quite human after a while, meaning that you have a lot of chromosomal re re rearrangements happening in culture. Um, so they're they're um, yeah, they're they're pretty they're pretty um, aberrant. Um, okay. Yeah, but people use them because you know you could still get some metrics um, out of them that are you know obviously the origins are human and there's still a lot of human like parameters that could be that could be measured and um, and they're easy to cultivate because they they grow like crazy and as you can see from this telomere assay um, they have re robust telomerase extension taking place and uh, telomere attrition is one of the kind of key drivers for, for um, senescence of primary cells in culture um, as was pointed out it's a, yeah no not a question but just a remark uh, now uh, it must be pretty easy to sequence this uh, hl uh, cells to know how different they are no? oh just, the hela uh, cells yeah, I... yeah, yeah, it is. But the the thing is that there's sub subclones and subpopulations. So my understanding is that ah okay uh, yeah the lab working with one batch of HeLa cells and the one across from the hall that's working with a batch of HeLa cells will probably have different chromosomal rearrangements. It's that insta unstable. So there's probably you're probably right, DDA. There's probably you know obviously you can't have complete anarchical rearranging and chaos. Otherwise these HeLa cells will turn into, I don't know what, alligator cells, but that's not going to happen. They're still human cells. So there's a, there's a certain constraint as to how much rearranging can possibly happen. And these still, still exist in, in some configuration that, that makes them act as, you know, fibroblasts. Um, but I, I honestly don't know if anybody's really embarked on, on such an endeavor. Um, and, you know, there's always the matter of time and funding, right? Um, maybe, maybe it shed, shed some important light on what are some, yeah, it's an interesting question, actually. Um, you know, not to go a little too far off the tangent, but, you know, hey, we have ideas that pop up here on these journal clubs, and I like those ideas, but it's, a, it's an interesting question as to what are all the kind of major categories, perhaps, of rearrangements that happen? In, in certain cancerous cells, and and maybe there's certain sub subcategories that that could be binned. Yeah, maybe there's a paper out there already that basically says, hey, you know, these are all the major subcategories of rearrangements that happen amongst chromosomes, because obviously certain 
areas of chromosomes are hot spots for recombination. Other areas are hot spots, you know, for other types of mutations. So, so yeah, um, yeah. I don't know. I don't know if anybody's really done an extensive kind of encyclopedic like kind of mapping of not just what happens in HeLa cells as they undergo these these variant changes, but other types of cancer cells. Um, something to look into PubMed to see if see if that exists out there. Okay, so um, this gets a little bit tricky here. <laughs> um, it's a little it's a little hard for me to figure out sometimes looking at. So they they um, so what do they do here? Um, I read this and the the, the figure legend is a, is a little wonky. So um, so what they're looking at in figure. To again, um, just to show that there's no. Um, so the interesting thing that they mentioned in this one finding that they have here is that um, they were expecting the bowhead whale fibroblasts to be kind of more resilient against oncogenic transformation, and it turns out that that's not the case. Um, that if they induce mutations in certain key oncogenic genes, so genes, so an oncogenic or a proto-oncogenic gene is a gene that basically um, causes cells to become cancerous and in, in a certain order. So in a petri dish, for example, um, one of the main drivers for oncogenesis is um, uh, increased cell proliferation um, through the upregulation of telomerase, which is HTERT. Um, cells also receive signals from the outside media um, telling them when to divide. So you have growth factors. So if you disconnect that signaling pathway, so if you have an active internal signaling pathway that tells the cell, hey, uh, keep dividing, even though there's no actual, you know, there's no actual uh, um, growth factor mentioning, well, mentioning this anthropomorphism, but there's no growth factor binding to a receptor, um, you can induce this mutation by, by having internal factors such as RAS, which is, a, which is an important intermediary pro protein that, um, that uh, is responsible for relaying essentially a, a signal in, in a, something called a phosphorylation cascade. So this HRAS G12V, which is a glycine, I believe, that's uh, that's changed into valine at position 12, um, it's an active RAS protein. So um, if you in, add that, you know, the, so the cells can now, you know, extend their telomeres. So they're not gonna, they're not gonna erode them. Um, the signaling pathway is skewed because the cells think they're getting a, a message, but um, in fact, it's just an overactive mutated RAS. Um, and also if you have now deleted or um, in ineffective p53 and rb retinoblastoma protein and p53 are known as tumor suppressors meaning they put the brakes on things like hras so if hras is going um, human ras is going aberrant um, you can you can shut down this the um, the cell cycle but now if you're missing these these proteins as well um, you know everything is uh, everything is basically going to go unchecked uh, PP2A, P10, um, I think that's involved in DNA repair. Am I correct? Uh, I keep forgetting what P10 does. They look at P10 later because it's a conserved gene and they use it for a different assay in the paper. Um, got blanking on P10. But anyway, so you have to have, you have to have like five different mutations in a human cell um, to essentially uh, take all the breaks off the cell and have it essentially um, go aberrant. And, and in, a, in, a, in a body, there's additional mutations that have to happen, um, uh, such as angiogenesis. So you have to have blood vessel growth, and the cells also have to um, also be able to um, migrate all over the place. And one way that there's a number of different in vitro ways that you can test whether or not all of these mutations actually lead to a tumor cell. And this is this soft agar assay. So essentially, if cells lose contact with the petri dish and they kind of float around, they, they either undergo apoptosis, um, uh, meaning that they undergo programmed cell death or they just stop dividing. Um, but if you have all of these um, mutations in place, the cells can float around and form this tumor-like ball of cells. And that is indicative that tumor genesis is taking place. Um, so, 
what they did was they induced all of these different changes. I think plus is expression of H hurt, H rash G twelve V, which is that mutant RAS is is not present, so you have normal RAS. Uh, or no, actually it's knocked out. Sorry. Um, wild type is just normal P fifty three, normal R B, normal P ten, um, and so on and so forth. So they have these different mutation um, mutations in either uh, human cells, which you have this little figure of a human or bowhead whale, which is there's what a bowhead whale looks like in in profile in a tiny picture. Um, and they also so when they um, when they inhibit p53 and RB, they use a number of different techniques. Um, one is also adding in this this protein. Um, so basically, um, SV40 is a is basically a, a, an oncogenic virus that can induce um, induce cells to become um, cancerous, and this LT is large T antigen. Um, I believe LTK is a um, uh, what's LTK? I think that's a um, large T antigen mutant, which it can't inactivate p53. That's used as a negative control, um, and I think LT delta four three four 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 is another. I think that's another mutant. Um, so they look at a number of different combinations, and I think the take-home message here is that you need one less mu mutation in the bowhead whale to get to these kind of tumorigenic um, uh, blobs of cells. So you do need HTERT, you do need HRAS, um, but you, but for um, for humans, you also need you need both p53 RB and also um, p10 uh, knocked out as well uh, for tumorigenesis to take place. In bowhead whales, I think you need um, you need the same thing, but you don't need to have uh, you don't need to have the p10 knocked out. So one less mutation is required. So basically, the authors are stating here that these cells are still capable of undergoing transformation, which is another word for you know oncogenesis, trans becoming transformed into tumor cell lines. Um, with you know at least as many hits as a human, actually potentially one less hit um, on some of these key oncogenic genes. Uh, two questions about this. One, do you need any idea why humans they don't have a picture of the human for anything except the last two columns? Why there's no two humans? For, why there's no humans for the last two columns? With the question. Yeah, the last two are the only two that have human. Pictures, yeah, I, so there are four don't. Yeah, I don't know. I, I'm not sure. Um, okay. They, and yeah. Uh, the other question was: it, it seems like, I mean, maybe I'm reading this wrong, but it, from, from those pictures, it looks like there is tumor growth or everything, but like the first two or three columns, like that fourth column also looks like it's got a tumor. It's not as big in this picture, but that's still a tumor, right? Yeah, I don't know how you classify tumors. It looks like looks and um, I mean, looks like you have. Yeah, you you still compared like to the healthy state. It looks notably bigger, like hundreds yeah, or thousands of times bigger. Yeah, so I'm not I'm not sure exactly what the you know uh, I mean unless unless if we had a human here, it would basically help clarify that a little bit as well to see if how that compares to a human. Um, you know, you so you have a mutant H turret, you have a mutant H ras, um, and you knock out R B, uh, which is knock out one of the breaks. Um, so you do have a tumor, yeah. So, you know, um... like I'm assuming that that first picture of the head whale and the first picture in column five of the human are what we should expect things to look like, like a healthy state, right? And there's yeah. basically no grouping of cells whatsoever, like maybe a tiny little dot in the middle. And then every other picture has some amount of clustering, which to me suggests that all of these are leading to cancer, but maybe I'm misreading this. Yeah, I mean, you're right about that. Um, there, they look like there's some, there's some, you know, perhaps data points missing there. Um, but if anything, that points to kind of, um, kind of more supports what they're saying is that these, sure. these, these bowhead whales are not, not expected to be very resistant uh, to, um, you know, resistant to cancer. Right. So the, the idea here being that 
bullhead whale gets cancer easier than a human if it ends up with the mutations. It needs less yep. mutations to get uh, tumor growth. Yep, yep. Uh, just one moment. Okay. Yeah, I can accept that. OK, um, sorry about that. So back to this image. All right, so uh, what did they look here? Tumor volume. Um, OK, so there's this is another assay that they use, which is you inject these nude mice. Um, see these four mice with tumors popping out all over them. Um, this C and D, it's, it's a, again, I think this paper is still kind of going through the editing process because um, the C and D really just shows that they were effective up here in knocking down um, P53, which, you know, it's kind of one of these figures where it's like, um, right, so RB minus minus, you have no RB, which you would expect, of course. Um, you kind of expect that to be probably put into a supplemental movie, but um, I was wondering what the significance of C and D were, and it appears that that is the only significance. Um, so here's a different assay where they, I believe, inject these fibroblasts into, into mice. Um, and yeah, so um, let's see, are these, these should all be bowhead whale. Volumetric growth, yep, bowhead whale, mouse xenograft assays. So, um, so yeah, you would expect to see, you know, the P53 knockout, RB, P10 knockouts, um, you know, the tumor volume rates increasing in, in, in all of these, uh, the one with the large T antigen, but this, let's see, the large T antigen is this one here, or is it that one here? No, it's this one here. Um, so basically just another metric, another assay for, you know, so you have a soft agar assay and you have this mouse assay showing that they are indeed, uh, the potential is there for tumor agenicity. So they're, they're growing um, uh, as tumors um, versus the controls that they have here, which is these um, large T antigens um, in wild type bowhead cells that are um, basically inactive. Um, so, uh, yeah. So the viral induction of cancer is actually kind of interesting historically because in the early 20th century, it wasn't actually known how cancer originated. So there was a lot of, a lot of discussion as to whether cancer is caused by viruses or caused by mutations. Um, turned out the answer is fundamentally, yeah, mutations, but um, viruses do cause cancers because they have certain antigens um, that can bind and inhibit certain proteins that are tumor suppressors. Um, and that led to a bit of confusion um, in the early days of um, research that primarily, I think, took place at the Rockefeller Institute here in New York City. So there's a bit of history there. Um, okay, so here we get to what's going on. So, you know, cells become cancerous in bowhead whales. They still have total telomere attrition. Um, and it turns out that, um, so it's in the supplemental, I believe, or additional figures where they also look at different kind of varieties of repair. Um, and they, the bowhead whales seem to have similar rates of what are called nucleotide excision repair and um, base, ex, uh, base excision repair. So the nucleotide is the actual, you know, the whole nucleotide with the ribose and the phosphate and base. And then the base is just the you know, the adenine part or thymine that's sticking out. So those could be all kind of trimmed out by certain enzymes. Um, but it turns out that the, um, what the whales do have uh, operating at a much higher efficiency is the repair of double-stranded breaks. Um, and it's interesting here because I'm gonna mention this briefly. Um, I'm gonna stop sharing here. Um, I'm gonna share my screen with presentation. There it is. So I think I mentioned this in earlier talks. Um, when you have a double-stranded break, there's two funda fundamental mechanisms, fundamentally different mechanisms that can take place to repair it. One is called NHEJ, so non-homologous end joining, and HR, or homologous recombination. Um, and the two pathways um, 
can coexist in cells, um, but some cells could, you know, preferentially will do one pathway versus another. And it's also very dependent on also which pathway takes, you know, precedence. It also depends on where the cell is in the cell cycle. Um, so there's a lot of kind of variability to, and this is going to be important in a few moments. There's a lot of variability that you find across species as well as within the same species as to where this, you know, which pathway is happening. Um, but essentially the way I see it is NHEJ is sort of quick and dirty. Um, you have a repair with a number of these enzymes um, that are listed here and additional ones as well um, that basically, you know, trim away the ends where double-stranded break is taking place and try to glue them back together as best as possible without inducing mutations. Um, but mutations typically happen at a much higher frequency here than they do in homologous recombination. Um, in HR, what is required is not just trimming away and then filling in these ends to the best of the enzyme's capability and gluing it together, meaning ligating the covalent bonds back together, um, but using a template, so using a homologous chromosome, so hence homologous recombination, to copy the missing pieces off of the other template DNA um, and that ensures a much more higher fidelity. So it's a slower process, but ensures a much more higher fidelity of, of repair. Where does yeah. it get the other set of DNA? Uh, diploid chromosomes. So you've got, you've got two pairs, of, you have a pair of chromosomes. So chromosome one, oh, right. the mom, chromosome yeah. one, two, yeah. So if you don't have that, um, then as, as you pointed out, Micah, you, you can't do that. So you need to have, you need to have a template. So um, that's sort of, so HR mechanisms are also um, underlie some of the techniques of um, gene therapy. So if you want to make a perfect copy somewhere um, in, in a chromosome and fix a mutation, then you need to have some sort of a template that you would put into the cell using some sort of delivery method um, that would, cop would be copied off of that template um, into your aberrant chromosome. Because obviously if you have two bad copies, in a cell, then obviously you can't use the bad copy to cop the fix. So, 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 so you have to put in a synthetic piece of DNA that is going to act as your good copy or your template to, to do that repair. And, and the two chromosomes don't exactly match. Like one's from one parent, one's from the other parent, right? And so yeah. when this happens, you may actually have a functional change. Yes, of course. Right? Yeah. Um, assuming, of course, yeah, you may you may have you may have a functional change. That's correct because you have alleles, so they could be right. they, they could they could be identical at those points. There you know, there's going to be you know I think on average there's a difference between two humans of like I'm just going to throw this number out there. It's probably a very gross it's average, small. but yeah, it's like one in a thousand you know nucleotides are different, right? So so as long as the functionality is preserved, that's great. But there will you know, inevitably be some differences, but not as much as NHEJ. So, um, just, uh, just speculating here, just uh, from a therapeutic standpoint, one could imagine if you sequence someone's genome and you find that they have a a particular gene, like say AP, APOE, right? Mm -hmm. And one parent they've got the bad one, and one parent they've got the good one. Hypothetically, you could just go delete the bad parent side from cells and then just let this HR somehow encourage the HR repair mechanism to kick in to then get the, the good one to take over. Um, I, mean, is, I recognize there's many problems with this and are, the challenges, are you, but- are you, are, you talk, are you talking about like knocking out a, knocking out a dominant, dominant yeah, gene? Yeah, you got a, a dominant gene that is bad, yeah. but then you also already have in your cell a good yes. gene that's not yes. dominant. You could knock out the bad one, and yes. the good one would just naturally fill in. Yes, if 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 that you know that is that is possible. So you could use CRISPR. You could use that's a lot easier to basically. I mean, like I kind of say, like you know, like uh, the hand wavy manner. But it is it is correct. Um, breaking things is a lot easier than than fixing things. Right. So yeah. so so inducing it. Induce, inducing a mutation that knocks something out is a lot easier than than, than fixing it precisely. Right. Let, let the cell fix it precisely. Assuming you could convince the cell to do the HR style, not the uh, NHEJ style. Yeah. Yeah. That, and that's and that's a, that's a, that's a project that I had students working on and off in my in uh, in my lab at um, the Cambar Center. We were trying to increase the efficiency of homologous recombination in 
CRISPR and other systems um, because putting in the double strand, so we're gonna segue a little bit into this and we'll loop back into this, um, but uh, because they do use CRISPR in this paper um, to, uh, to measure mutation rates um, at some locations, I think at the P, conserved P10 gene, but anyway, um, but yeah, so, so, so putting in a break is kind of one step for, for, um, for NHEJ or, or HR to take place, um, as we saw in that kind of um, schematic figure. So you do need to put in a double-stranded break first um, before you, you, you kind of either break the gene or try to fix it precisely. Um, but if you do put in a template to get the cell to do HR, if the cell is not really primed to do HR, if it's missing some of those key enzymes, then it's gonna, the HR part is gonna happen at a very low efficiency, like 10% or 5%. It all depends on the cell type, it depends on like, so, so there's been a number of studies to figure out ways to boost that efficiency. Um, one kind of, one area of kind of tactics is to repress the NHEJ enzyme. So basically if you kind of inhibit the NHEJ, perhaps you can get the system to shunt its way towards HR. Um, the way that we were looking at it is to try to increase the local concentration uh, using a variety of techniques to um, uh, have a, uh, using fu various fusion proteins to essentially try to increase the local concentration of various HR enzymes to see if we can um, get, get, that, uh, get the efficiency of that to work higher. Are there any animals that we know of that have much higher HR versus NHEJ? Uh, yeah, fairly. <clears throat> yeah, actually, a very simple organism. Um, yeast, Saccharomyces cerevisiae, does HR like crazy, like gangbusters. Any 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 mammals or anything close to us, or yeast is um, close we know of? Um, I'm not sure off the top of my head. Um, I'd have to That's take fine. a look. Yeah. But 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 we but yeah but um, but definitely some of the enzymes. Um, it, it may have something to do with with some of the some of the subunits of some of the enzymes, some of the domains of some of the enzymes that might recruit additional factors. So, so part of our studies we were trying to look at looking at um, some key homology, uh, some key enzymes that are required for homologous recombination from other species. So, um, and see basically if we can increase the effectiveness of HR in humans by adding in these addition these these right. enzymes from other species. Um, Okay, so what did they see? So they had an assay that they made um, in, in uh, see. they had an assay to basically in figure three to look at NHEJ efficiency. Um, so they, they're measuring non-homologous end joining efficiency using um, these low passage skin fibroblasts. Um, uh, and what the way that they did this assay is they don't have a schematic of it, but I'm gonna stop sharing here. And I'm going to use my hands, um, so we don't have a chalkboard, we don't have a PowerPoint, um, but I do have my hands. So the whiteboard feature in Zoom, if you just click the button at the bottom there. Oh, they do have a whiteboard feature. Probably, let's see if my whiteboard, this whole thing, oh, whiteboard. Okay, let's take a look. Let's see, this is the first time I've used the Zoom whiteboard feature. We'll Ooh. see how good you are at drawing with a mouse. <laughs> oh, man. Most humans are terrible at it. Uh, okay. I'm gonna close this. I've, I've I've seen Keith use this whiteboard to, uh, to try to like um, on our project to try to like um, show us how different um, how different sound frequencies look, and it always ends up being pretty wild. <laughs> uh, okay, so let's take a look. All right, let me. Oops. So I gotta click on something. Like draw. Okay. I think I have a. I think it should be able to work through this. Push. All right. And it looks like it's collaborative. Oh. Okay, so this is the GFP gene. God, that's horrible. Um, inserted into somewhere. Um, here is two. There, here is in this GFP gene an exon that kind of disrupts the gene, and here are two restriction sites. ISCE1 or IS1, ISCE, can't write, <laughs> it's a C, ISCE1. So right here and right here. So if, if this is put in, and there's a promoter here, so if this is put into a cell, you're going to get a defective GFP gene and you're not gonna get reinforcing cells. 
if you add in an enzyme and you cut right here and you cut right here, then you cut out this exon and you have a double-stranded break that is um, these ends are compatible here and here, and this is missing. Um, but this is also not going to express because you have a big chunk missing here. The only way that this is can express correctly is if this is repaired properly. So if you have a perfect repair and not add any any wacky insertions or deletions or or you know or any kind of aberrant mutations, um, if this is repaired correctly, then you all of a sudden have GFP expression taking place. Um, and then you can measure the efficiency of GFP expression by adding in another gene that's already, you know, so, so you have to look at efficiency of transformation. So RFP is your positive control. So every cell that gets this and this, every cell is going to be RFP positive, but not every cell is going to be GFP positive. So then you can get a ratio between the RFP positive um, cells that are also GFP positive, and then you can get a basically a well a ratio at this to see how efficiently these cells were able to repair uh, repair this locus. Okay, um, I think that worked <laughs> somewhat. Yeah, it seems successful to me. Okay, good enough. Um, so let's go back here. So that's the assay that they that they did, um, and I think what they did here is oops, let's take a look, remind myself. Uh, yep, yeah, that's what they did. Uh, okay, so they have several different. So okay, so they add in this system, and I believe it's on a plasmid into um, mouse, cow, human, and whale. And as you can see here, the efficiency of repair. Um, meaning, you know, how how precisely this this you know the GFP was was prepared using by inducing this after inducing ISC one is much higher, you know, way higher in whales. Um, they also zap them with two grades of radiation, um, and there's another metric that they measure. Um, I'm not familiar with this, so you get this nuclear fragmentation. You have these micronuclei forming, meaning that there's a lot more. Um, the chromosomes are much more unstable. So I guess the repair is not working as efficiently, and you get also um, cells that are in whales, bowhead whales, you have less cells with micronuclei. So what they also do is, you know, so the efficiency using the simple assay, the simple reporter, and this, this is kind of similar to um, a system that we we're developing in our lab to test for homologous recombination efficiency repair. Um, is this kind of simple reporter-based assay to see how, how readily the repair happens. Um, they also sequenced around the junction, um, which is important. So this is the yellow is that uh, ISCE junction. Um, the pink is deletions. So basically, you know, uh, this is supposed to represent a certain number of sequences back, you know, um, uh, sequences that are um, ranging on either side. I don't know exactly how many base pairs, um, but and I believe these, all of these different rows probably represent different cells uh, or different cell lines. That is my, that is my hunch. Uh, I can see that in the figure legend, but that makes sense is that you have a lot less cells with, a lot, lot less cells have, you know, have, having deletions um, in the bowhead whales uh, than in humans. Um, and they also looked at mouse, cow, human, bowhead whale, looking at indels, which are just an abbreviation for insertions and deletions. Um, and different sizes of insertion and deletions um, um, uh, that are close to that break site. And they look at the size range and you can see that, you know, they going from zero to 200, um, you have, you, you have insertions and deletions that are much smaller for both for, you know, in bowhead whales compared to both humans, cows and mice. Um, and then they just basically, you know, here they kind of really go to task and, and try to characterize the sizes of these deletions and insertions. And basically the bottom line is that you really have, you know, if any deletions happen or insertions, they're much smaller in bowhead whales. Um, and you basically just have smaller, um, uh, you have really more point mutations um, in the bowhead whale or substitutions than you have these kind of large chunks uh, that are missing. Um, now, interestingly, um, so they mentioned that this is a measure for uh, 
NHEJ. Um, so uh, in this figure here, they kind of jump and they, they try to um, implicate a protein um, called CI, CIRBP. And I think it was discovered like 20 years ago. It's cold inducible RNA binding protein. And it's, there's a number of proteins that are required for DNA repair. Um, they, I think they, they don't, they might be in the supplemental data, but they do a lot of, um, they do a lot of, uh, I think, RNA, you know, expression analyses to see which proteins are upregulated in bowhead whales. And the CIRBP uh, tends to be upregulated at a high, high rate. And it basically sort of um, uh, binds to proteins that are recruited to sites of where DNA damage is occurring, which makes sense. And the whale has high levels of this. Um, now, this figure here, um, they look at NHEJ efficiency using that same assay I mentioned earlier, saying GFP and you know, and, and also the the the, um, uh, the uh, RFP, the red, used, you know, as a positive control. Um, and they show that if you put human cell, if you take human cells and you add in this bowhead whale CIRBP, uh, you get a higher NHEJ efficiency using this assay. Um, and they also mention here that if you knock it down, you get lower. But they also mention that the homologous repair efficiency is also um, improved. Um, the only the kind of question I have, and I was looking through this paper, is I, I don't know how the authors are distinguishing between NHEJ and HR efficiency. Um, because as I showed from the previous you know, figure as a kind of an overview and highlight, there are two fundamentally different repair pathways. Um, and the only way you can really get the HR working is in this system here is if you have also a template to repair uh, that broken GFP using 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 a GFP template, right? That you you provide because there is no in these cells. Um, I don't think that there's a naturally occurring GFP on the other chromosome, so you'd have to add in that template. Um, so you'd have to have an assay that kind of distinguishes between whether or not your efficiency of HR went up versus the efficiency of the NHEJ. So that being said, I'm, I'm not 100% certain here how, even in the prior figure, the, the authors, so it's clear to me that repair is much more efficient. Double-stranded break repair is much more efficient. Um, and it looks like the CR, CIRBP protein is playing a role in it. Um, but I'm not certain how the authors are distinguishing that the repair efficiency is because of improved NHEJ efficacy or if it's improved homologous recombination. Um, I don't know if anybody has any comments about that. I had the same question. I was just kind of hoping it would be answered somewhere along the way. Uh, it sounds like not. No, unless it was somewhere in the uh, supplemental, which I didn't see here, right? Uh, but it wasn't in the figure. It wasn't, in, and so, so again, this has not been peer reviewed yet. So hopefully, the authors will address that somewhere. And if if they did address it, and it's in like a you know, if it's in the supplemental and I just couldn't find it, uh, my apologies. But I, I couldn't, um, I couldn't figure out how, how you would distinguish the two. Um, so I'm just going to say that right now, it seems clear from figure three um, that, yeah, repair is, at, for, uh, for double-stranded breaks um, using the system, it's it's way more efficient in bowhead whales. Um, but I, I would be interested to see whether or not um, more more NHEJ or HR is taking place. Interestingly, if we look at the, these blots, these Western blots here, um, they look at a number of different proteins. Um, Q80 and Q70, um, I believe, are important proteins for NHEJ, but are not really don't really play a role in don't really. So here's this Q70, Q80, DNA PKCS are not really playing a big role in um, in strand exchange and homologous recombination. So if we go back to, you know, do we have uh, reason? Yeah. Do we have reason to believe that bowhead whales do the normal amount of NHEJ versus HR? Is it possible that bowhead whales just do almost exclusively HR and Kirby P is part of that? 
Yeah. Well, it'd be interesting. Well, I'm not sure if they. Well, so okay. So for the for the. So. So for this assay that they're doing with the GFP, um, they claim that it's it's measuring just NHEJ, and that makes sense because there's no template for GFP that they add there. So even if the bowhead whales were doing greater HR, so. Uh, you know what are what are they using as a as kind of a as a template um, unless there's some kind of weird HR mechanism taking place. Yeah. How uh, do they get GFP in if they're not using um, HR? Well, I'm sure uh, I think they're just transfecting these cells using either uh, using either a viral. This is in this is in petri, so, petri dishes, yeah. So not GFP in a chromosome, just GFP DNA strand floating around the nucleus. Yeah, let me take a look here because they look at they look at repair efficiencies at a at a GFP that's integrated, I believe, at the P10 locus. But in this case here, uh... so you got some cells, they got some GFP genes just floating or free floating by themselves, not part of the chromosome. Yeah. Then me... they break them and see how well they repair. Yeah, let and... me let me let me just double check check that because there's two ways they could do it here. They could either integrate this... it. Let's see. Does HR? Okay. Yeah. So, so just thinking that through, if, if you are in transfecting cells with GFP, a significant number of them are going to get two copies of that GFP. Would that not serve as the template that needed for HR? It could. Um, it could. Uh, so they're co-transforming them. Um, you know, that's that's always. That's always an issue. You try to get the ratios, you know, correct, but um, uh, my, my understanding is, is that we're we're not particularly good at getting an exact amount of genes into cells. Maybe maybe they're doing one cell at a time, where it's much more. You no. Know, um, yeah. Um, well, there's, there might be there, you might be able to calculate the efficiency of, of transformation, um, but there's a potentiality for what you just mentioned to be happening. Um, I can't give you a calculation off the top of my head to, to tell you how, yeah. how how rare that would be. Um, but it looks here, looking at the looking at the materials and methods here, that this was this was done with plasmids and not integrated. In a location in a genomic. Yeah. Uh, actually, let me just double check here, because if it was integrated in genomic location, then 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 that will take care of that problem. Um, if we grant co-transfected with plasmids, doesn't look like it. Um, I'm, yeah. I'm certainly wildly speculating here, but maybe if HR is much more powerful in bowhead whale cells, maybe their cells are just really good at when you have two copies of some random gene floating around, the cells are really good at put, finding them when they have a break versus human cells, for example, may just, you know, ah, can't, find a, can't find a template, so let's just go ahead and do the NHEJ. Yeah, it could be. It could be. Uh, you know, Again, I mean, it's it's interesting here to look at humans and the the, the factors that are really important for NHEJ are like way overexpressed in the humans, so at least yeah. the cell fibroblasts are looking at here than whale, right? Um, so that's that that clearly kind of jumps out at you immediately. Uh, that NHEJ is like uh, the fact that at least the factors that are required. Now it could also be that I don't I don't know the structure of whale DNA PKCS or Q80 Q70. It could just be that they're also slightly different, so it's a much more efficient NHEJ process. Or it could be that H, there's, some, there's something happening with the HR system that's kind of radically much more efficient, as you mentioned, um, Mike, that um, that could be taking place. Um, if, that, if that's the case, then that's very interesting, um, because then that, uh, that would mean that, you know, that HR in, in whales is, is way more effective than in humans. Um, we have and if, yeah. We have the ability to disable NHEJ entirely, thereby forcing either HR yeah. or nothing. Uh, yeah, we do um, I, by by disrupting these these factors such as Q80, okay. Q70. Um, it'd, be, and... it'd be interesting to to see like 
to take human and blood whale cells, disrupt NHEJ entirely, like just halt it, and then do double strand breaks and just see, you know, make, if the bowhead whale still repairs just as much as it did with NHEJ, and that suggests that HR is dominant. So yeah. it implies that HR is dominant there, whereas if both of them end up failing to repair much of the time, that suggests that NHEJ is, in fact, what's going on. Yeah, I was, yeah, um, I, those ideas were bouncing around my head, to the, you know, a little bit also when I was when I was reading this, we could go down the NHEJ versus HR rabbit hole a little bit more on this, and I think that would that would really, um, like you mentioned, Micah, uh, like I think uh, shed some light on on these mechanisms uh, a bit more because there's a lot of labs that are that are working on you know NHEJ versus HR um, and and really studying like the the nitty gritty details of these of these pathways, yeah. um, and that would be. Yeah, that would be that would be, and also would shed a lot of you know light on uh, on a potential longevity mechanism, right? If if uh, if, yeah. if one or the other is super you know important, you know if if this is like one of the key drivers for bowhead whales, you know, two hundred plus year longevity, then um, then it would be really intriguing to to see um, if we can kind of recapitulate that in in, in human cells. Yeah. So. Um, so they implicate this protein CR, CIRBP, um, which is expressed to very high levels in whales. Um, and it's a, like I mentioned, it's a cold, it stands for cold inducible RNA binding protein. And it recruits a whole bunch of like um, proteins to the site of double stranded breaks. Um, and I don't know, you know, again, uh, is C, CIRBP, is that, is that uh, does that also tend to shunt things more towards NHEJ or towards HR versus NHEJ? I'm I'm not sure. They mentioned that the NHEJ efficiency goes down if you add in, you know, um, uh, inhibitory you know RNAs that knock down CIRBP. But what about um, so? They also look at HR efficiency and they put in a mutant CIRBP and that efficiency seems to go down, but Again, my caveat here is I'm not sure how they set up the assay to figure out the difference between HR efficiency versus NHEJ efficiency. What is the, what is that uh, green bar there? H. The uh, human. Green. So human CIRBP. You're both showing human cells. Is that correct? Yeah. So it's a control here. So, so th that's my my question here. So this is um. So if we look at the figure legend for was it C? Yeah, I think I had the same question here. B and, B and C. Uh, I'm assuming they're using bowhead whale version of the Kirby P. Yeah. Versus um, the human version, but are they upregulated in both cases? Or yeah, I don't know. How does the H Kirby P versus control? That's, what's the difference between those two, I guess, what I'm asking? That's a good question. I don't know. Um, is I mean, because obviously the control would be human fibroblast, so they would have human CRBP. Right. Is the control here? basically just knocked out endogenous human CRBP with human CRBP added back in on a plasmid, such as what's being uh, done with the head. That, that could be the case, but if that's the case, I didn't, I didn't see it. That's just, I, I, I didn't see that mentioned in the, maybe it's in the, in the materials yeah. and methods that, you know, that'd that's be, how you, that'd be nice to know. Yeah. So it, it might be, you know, um, so, so yeah. So my, my main question is how are we, Figuring out, um, so that's another another issue there. It could be buried there somewhere in the materials and methods. Um, if it if it is, then um, it'd be nice if they put it into the figure legend as well um, to kind of clarify that. Um, but you know, my ma other major issue is really trying to tell the difference between NHEJ and HR because I, I wasn't really clear um, using that methodology how you know uh, how you can really distinguish HR, especially if you're, if, if I don't see a template being, being used there. Um, okay. So, um, I think oh, and in, in the caption for this says in these assays, double strand breaks are induced within inactive NHEJ or HR reporter cassettes. So I guess the, the way to test this is what we talked about. They disable NHEJ. Uh, where here? For test. Uh, in the figure? Yeah. Legend? Figure legend, um, 
Oh, up here. In, yes, yeah, you're in, in these assays. There you go. Are induced with inactive NHEJ. Are induced within inactive NHEJ. So my guess is what, what, one of them oh. they inactivate NHEJ, the other one they inactivate HR. And uh, the efficiency. Um, so what I'm, the way I'm reading this is that, um, maybe I'm reading this incorrectly, is that in these assays, double-stranded breaks using the I the ICE-1 endonuclease, the ISC-1 endonuclease are induced. So inactive, I think, meaning that the GFP is not active or expressed. So if they say NHEJ or HI reporter cassettes, um, this might be in a material method. Maybe the HR reporter cassette had a, um, had a template within, uh, with, within, within the reporter. Um, I, sorry, within the plasmid, uh, but I don't, yeah, it might be in the supplemental. I, I don't see a picture of that here anywhere. Yeah, we, we, we can move on. Yeah, okay. Um, okay, so there's a bunch of other supplemental figures that we probably have time to go into. All right, so where were we? Figure four. Okay, uh, so they implicate the upregulation of the CR, CIRBP um, gene. Um, they also noted that, um, so there's, I believe there's also a human version of CIRBP. Um, what do they look at here? Cells with micromanipulate yeah. AI. So if you add in bowhead whale CIRBP into human cells, you also get kind of, um, you know, a lower amount of micronuclei. Um, G, is that, let's see, I got the yeah, so I don't know if they knock down CIRBP here. This is kind of interesting. Here they start. Here, here they start in the discussion. Start doing some interesting implications in that CIRBP. So NHEJ efficiency seems to go up in cells in human cells if you decrease the temperature. Uh, and they they mention a whole bunch of you know therapies that people do, including surgery. You know by inducing hypothermia, and that that can potentially you know be have an advantageous effect against um, you know inflammation which is well known um, and as well as upper giving DNA repair processes which I'm not sure how well known that is um, I'm not sure if they so in G before they can implicate that obviously you would have to knock out CIRBP and you would have to really you know try to pin that down a little bit more efficiently um, I'm assuming bowhead whales have a lower body temperature than humans. Around I'm, assume, degrees lower. I'm assuming that they do. Yeah, I think they mentioned that as well. Uh, I, and I don't think they. I think they mentioned somewhere in the paper that the levels of bowhead whales, like CRBP, is just always like very high. So as as that figure showed, that it was kind of um, it didn't seem to fluctuate as much with temperature, meaning that it's just the CIRBP levels were just extremely high in in bowhead when they, whales. When they do all these. All the rest of the tests that don't mention temperature is temperature. Is, is there like a standard temperature to do these assays at that we should assume, like human internal well, temperatures? Yeah, sure. They always do it at 37 degrees um, Celsius. Okay. That's that's just always that's that's you know that's uh, standard way to do this. Standard body temperature. It's all you know, unless you're doing some sort of conditional mutants, you know, at 30 or 32, where the where the proteins become mutated at low temperature. <laughs> Or you're, or you're doing some kind of heat stress analysis at 42, but for pretty much every most cell lines, at least that I've worked with in primary cells, the, the your your um your CO2 incubator is usually just default set to 37 degrees Celsius. Gotcha. Yeah. yeah. I just want to um, make just, sure that I was curious if this bowhead whale Kirby P, which supposedly is better, actually functions at 37 degrees. So if everything, all these assays were done at 37, then it looks like yes, they do. Yeah, so um, I I mean it's a good question actually because you know some cell some cell lines in different species will you know you you definitely it has to be species specific so um, that's that's a good question um, uh, you know presumably when they presumably when they put the bowhead whale Kirby B into human cells they ran them at thirty. Seven degrees, and those ones outperformed regular. So that's what I'm assuming. Um, unless all things being equal, I'm a, I, I I will assume that that is the case. Yeah. Okay. 
Yeah. Otherwise, it it, it should be mentioned that that, that was right. you know different because because um because yeah because to your point um different proteins are optimized evolved right in different environments including environments yeah. within cells. So if 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 the if they mention here that the you know that the that the body temperature of a bowhead whale is normally 33 degrees Celsius, then you could have some deleterious effect potentially on the protein if you jack it up an extra five degrees or so, right? Yeah. Um, so, and, and that might lower the efficiency, but if you're throwing the human cells at 37 and the bowhead whale CRBP is still working at a high efficiency at 37, then, well, I guess maybe it's resilient it's enough. Not. Yeah. Um, but, but that's, that's a good point actually. Um, okay. So what did they do in this final figure? Um, I think in this final figure, they actually do a, a, a bit cleaner assay than what was done with the plasmids. And they looked at, um, efficiency repair at a, um, at a gene locus P10, uh, that is very, uh, similar, if not almost identical in sequence to, you know, between bowhead whales and humans. Um, to kind of make sure that and make sure that there's no like differences in just you know sequence differences that might throw off the repair efficiency. So they wanted to find a very conserved uh, conserved uh, uh, location. So they so they looked at the P10 allele, um, and I think they in, in this they built if I'm not mistaken they used CRISPR. Uh, okay, so they used CRISPR to induce double stranded breaks in the P10 gene. Um, and did they add in, let's see, did they add in that reporter system in there or did they, or did they just basically do sequence analysis? Uh, let me just, just scroll up here. Um, sorry, this paper is um, in this format here. So, uh, if you look at it on BioArchive in the HTML version, it's a more normal format. It's more normal. Get okay. the figures in line with the text. Okay. So, um, so maybe I'll ask the everybody joining in to do a little bit of heavy lifting for me here. Um, so they're looking at efficiency of repair of a double-stranded break that was induced in the P10 locus um, uh, using this using using CRISPR. Um, and let's see. A, B, and C. So these are prime. So A is primary human fibroblasts. Um, uh, so um, so they so they're also trying to identify some of the pathway members. So I believe that um, CIRBP, um, one of the one of the repair enzymes that it recruits is um, RPA. Um, this RPA enzyme. So there's a couple of variants. So they use an RPA inhibitor to knock knock it down. Uh, which is called TDLR505, probably some drug compound, um, or transfected with human RPA complex after CRISPR double strand break induction at a conserved region. Um, and then B is. Okay, so these are B is primary uh, fibroblast from bowhead whales, also uh, after, you know, knocking down TDL, uh, knocking down um, RPA with this inhibitor drug. Um, and then C is distribution of sequence P10 alleles in human fibroblasts with length of viral expression of luciferase. Or, ah, so now they're adding in the bow whale, bow whale, bow whale, uh, C R I C I R B P um, enzyme. Um, so you would expect that efficiency to increase. Okay. Uh, so. So A is human, B is bowhead whale, C is human. Uh, so this is basically the different types of mutations that are there, deletions that are large, deletions that are small and pink, insertions, substitutions. So these are point mutations. Um, so more red and more pink is basically not as good as less red and less pink. It's, um, not a big fan of this. Uh, According to legend, at least, different scale. Mm. Three base pairs versus twenty base pairs. Oh which right, greatly here. distorts the yeah. things. Yeah. Um, well, it, yeah, it, it does. Even though, yeah, yeah, it does greatly distort things. Um, even though, 
it would actually be smaller if they if they stuck to it, right? Because here, yeah, um, like the red would the red would probably disappear. I think. Yeah, I think that was their point. But yeah, to to your point, you know, it 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 kind of uh, messes it up a bit to, to kind of compare it. Although that would be a good thing if yeah. the red completely disappeared, right? Because if the deletions right. are are you know, just well, greater I mean, than three base pairs or less than three base pairs. But uh, yeah, good, good thing for Bowhead Whale. Uh, not particularly good for us because when we put <laughs> Bowhead Whale Kirp, Kirpy B, it doesn't appear to have done anything in human French blasts. Yes, yes. Um, well, I mentioned it's what is it? It's slightly, slightly more unmodified, but kind of hard to yeah. say if that's slight as anything. Um, the I think that RPA is much more interesting. Yes. So RPA is something that. Uh, um, CIRBP or KerbyP is recruiting, um, and uh, you know, and maybe that's maybe that's a major factor. Um, at least it seems to be, but it's kind of hard to say if you know uh, you're still getting these large deletions taking place in yeah. themselves. I wonder if I wonder why they didn't do uh, bowhead whale KerbyP plus RPA. Uh, good question. Um, well, I mean. Or maybe plus uh, plus RPA, right? Because it seems that they yeah. that there's a lot of already um, this curve BP is 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 really I, I don't know what the stoichiometry is, um, but it's you know based on that gel, it's certainly a much brighter blob, right? So there's more curve BP. Yeah. Then if that's the only story, so it's hard to tell. So um so this is kind of just a general schematic here. Um, doesn't really tell us much more than we already know that. Kirby P is implicated, and RPA is this other protein as well, and they also implicate um, uh, uh, poly ADP ribosylase, which is this protein that um, adds these ribosyl groups, um, ADP ribosyl groups that are these kind of branches and chains that help recruit other repair enzymes. So um, I don't know if they haven't measured that directly. So this is basically, um, you know, just a uh, a tentative schematic of what might be taking place, um, you know, um, so we really haven't gotten into the details yet here. I don't want to kind of focus too much on this. We haven't gotten into details as to, as to, you know, how this is at the molecular level, you know, increasing the efficiency of either NHEJ or, or homologous, you know, or homologous recombination. Um, kind of the most important take home point of this paper, which, which, you know, Kind of dovetails with the paper that we discussed like a year and a half ago with the increased rate of somatic muta somatic mutations both indel support mutations in you know uh in organisms um so in so you have an inverse correlation of the rate at which these mutations happen uh with the maximal lifespan across the board with mammals and i don't think in that paper that we looked at they had bowhead whales um they had they had certainly mice cows and Humans and uh, um, uh, naked mole rats. Um, they might have had bowhead whales. I, I didn't see that in the figure that I, I pulled up. Um, but this adds kind of further credence that kind of one of the main drivers uh, for longevity is, you know, fundamentally taking care of, of these mutations that happen at the somatic level. So we've talked a lot about epigenetic changes that happen um, as organisms age. And enzymes that are required to, you know, to basically kind of reset those epigenetic changes to a more youthful state, um, but that's also occurring fundamentally here at at the somatic mutation level. So, increased efficiency of double-stranded breaks um, seems to go hand in hand uh, with the bowhead whale longevity. Now, in order to in order to know that for uh, you know for certain. Um, we need to knock down some of these enzymes and kind of do an assay to, to gauge for, you know, for longevity in, clearly we can't do a bowhead whale longevity assay in the wild, right? Um, or ethically and just problematically with time. So we'd have to come up with an uh, in vitro uh, tissue culture based approach in which we can, you know, knock down some of these elements, um, increase somatic mutation rates and show that, you know, show that we have, accelerated, essentially accelerated aging happening um, with bowhead whales. Um, it'd be interesting to see what the, you know, how the, how this, I mean, there's a lot of experiments that could, could be done, how this basically influences epigenetic status as well. The, do we have any idea? 
data how go ahead whale mutation rate compares with human um, non somatic cell mutation rate? All right, we've talked about that. You mean you mean germline mutation rate, or do you mean? Yeah, ger germline cells seem to repair much better from the paper I, we looked at a couple. Yeah, I don't know. I don't know if anybody. Ago. Yeah, it's a good question. I, I have, I have, I mean, a lot of these organisms are not like, you know, I mean, sequence analysis is trivial these days. So getting getting sequence, you know, sequences is 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 easy. Getting different cells and different cell biopsies is a lot harder. I. I off the top of my head, I don't know if any, if anybody's working on germline mutation rates in bowhead whales. Uh, sorry, not germline mutation rates in bowhead whales. That, that would also be interesting. But I'm just curious, how does human germline cell mutation rates compare against bowhead whale somatic mutation rates? And the reason I'm curious about that is because when when deciding what avenue to explore, like introducing bowhead whale genes into a human is likely to be problematic. Yeah. Uh, whereas just getting your germline, your somatic cells to behave more like germline cells may be easier. And so if you get just as much benefit by following that path, then if you yeah. have to pick a research path to go down, go down that one. Uh, yeah. Whereas Absolutely. if bowhead whales have like, you know, 10x over germline human cells, you want to focus on the bowhead whale path. That's a good question. It's a good question. I, 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 I don't know. Um, yeah, that might help guide. That might guide help guide, like practical therapeutic intervention type research in, in one of yeah. one of the two avenues. Of course, you know, knowing knowing that from a fundamental perspective is is also uh, would also clarify a lot of things as far as which pathways are are involved. Um, yeah, I, I I don't know. So in uh, in the supplemental material, the last image. Um, I think I'm reading this correctly. It looks like just expression of the bowhead whale kerpy bee is way higher than the expression of human kerpy bee. Are you talking about this? The, the very last supplemental. Um, oh, the supplemental last. Okay. Yeah, like extended data figure nine. Am I reading that right? That bowhead whales not only have this allegedly better kerpy bee, but they've got just huge amounts more of it. Um, you're talking about figure D? Yeah. Yeah, figure D. Uh, yeah, I mean, that makes, that makes, uh, I mean, that certainly correlates with the Western blot that we saw up there. Oh, okay. Yeah. Um, so, so, can I raise a, yeah. sort of a broader point just on, on this thing with the bowhead whales? There is obviously a question as to whether um, the longevity of the bowhead whale causes it to select for improved double improved DNA repair or whether improved DNA repair itself is the cause of longevity because obviously you know DNA repair is a bigger issue the longer lived a creature is so you have this this challenge and we can't resolve that very easily because obviously they live a long time so we don't really know why and the testing for that's difficult but I, I do think there is there is a question um, as to how important DNA repair is, and obviously the longer lived a creature is, the more important it is, and the more likely it will actually be able to select for improved DNA maintenance. Well, yeah, so, so I mean, so it's, like I said, it's, it's, a, it, that's a good point, and it's, it's hard to, you know, it's hard to kind of do these experiments in bowhead whales, but we could try to re recapitulate some of that enhanced DNA repair in shorter lived organisms, um, you know, if, if the hypothesis is correct. That uh, that a significant chunk of of lifespan and longevity is 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 correlated with the efficiency of DNA repair um, and a decrease in the rate of somatic mutations. Um, then yeah, boosting those pathways in a mouse, for example, should lead to you know should should lead to um, a longer lived longer lived mouse, right? Or or anything else that kind of and and knocking down those. Certainly, knocking down those those processes will, you know, might not lead to accelerated aging. Probably lead to you know more more cancer in in, in mice. But certainly, increasing that rate of the efficiency of repair should lead to an increased longevity. Sorry, uh, I have to leave uh, because of another meeting. But I wanted to say uh, three things before leaving. Uh, the first one is uh, thank you for all information even if I don't understand everything. The second one is uh, maybe it would be 
uh, it could be interesting to have uh, the other whales uh, sequence because I think that the bow, bowhead whales he, is the whale living uh, the longest. And I think that there are some whales who don't live so long. I mean, mm-hmm. uh, like uh, 50, 60 years. It would be interesting to compare where. Mm-hmm. Why? Do you know if it was done already? And maybe now the, the last question is uh, something I don't understand. Uh, until a few, I would say, years ago, many people were speaking about uh, the Hayflick limit. Um, do you know about the... Uh, is there a Hayflick limit also for whales and um, yeah. well, I suppose, and it's a lot higher than uh, humans or not, or you, you know, just uh... well, there at least for the cells looked at here in this paper, there is a Hayflick limit um, because they they don't express telomerase, so um, so there there is a there is a limit. Um, if we look at and that that was in the paper, I wasn't really able to. I don't know if it was couldn't really kind of quantitate that um, based on the figure, but if we could look at the figure, and that was figure... The, the first figure? Yeah, first one. figure one, yeah. Um, and it suggests over. that they actually have a shorter, maybe, hate limit. Right, so if, so uh, population, well, it's starting with zero, I don't know why it's starting with 20 here. Um, so this is... Uh, oh yeah, that is weird. Wait, uh, it's okay. So this is so bowhead whale, and then bowhead whale H three. Oh well, and there's probably starting later because of just the way that the transformations happen. Let's forget about that. So let's look at. So if we do look at humans, uh, if we look at um, so days. Well, yeah, you're right. Sorry, I misread that. Um, Whales do seem to last longer. Yeah, I mean, well, okay. So so the issue. So the issue here is, so one thing is that the population, so doubling is slower. So they, they do divide slower, um, you know, that, that could be tied into the efficiency of DNA repair as well, um, because you need more time to repair damage. So that, that, that could correspond to that. Now, as far as, uh, but then of course they undergo replicative senescence to your point, DNA, they, they undergo the hate flip limit. Um, and it seems to undergo, you know, Roughly about the same amount, maybe a little less population doublings. Um, yeah. So, so yeah, kind of hard. I can't really extrapolate anything else from that. But, but yeah, they they do undergo the hate for me. My my assumption is that the bowhead whales cells replicate slower, so that helps. Like if you're trying to live longer, you know, having each of your cells last longer and there and replicate less is good. Um, with regards to Hayflick limit and whatnot, but it doesn't seem that they have, they last more, longer in terms of doubling time. They last longer in terms of, you know, days or yes. years, yes. not in terms of number of doubles. And, and, that, and, I'm, and that might be correlated just, with... Just saying, uh, yeah. thank you for the answers. Uh, no, I have absolutely to leave because I, my meeting is just starting uh, in a few minutes. Have okay. a good uh, end of the day for those who are in Bye. Bye. All right. Take care, Didier. We'll probably be wrapping up shortly too. Um, but yeah, so so it, it you know it could very well be that that uh, that the slower rate of division is also correlated with the higher efficiency of repair. Um, that's a good question. I know in general it is because cells you know cells obviously need to slow down and stop. When they have mutations to repair in during you know during S phase during the synthesis of DNA, so so that will lead to slower division. Um, Does HR not, take yeah. longer? Versus NHEJ? Um, again, that's a good question. Off the top of my head, I don't know what the kinetics are. I would assume it's longer, um, especially if you have a longer sequence of DNA to um, template DNA to scan across. Um, and you also have to find and recruit the template as well. You have to find and recruit Some the template consumer. using using factors, yeah. So I, I, would, yeah. Ass, I would assume, I mean, those are all great, great questions and we'll jot them down to look them up. Kinetics of, you know, uh, you know, this answer might be very well known. Um, so kinetics of NHEJ versus HR, um, also correlation of division rate 
plus efficiency of repair. Does that trend? I'm not sure um, if people have looked at that. Maybe they have. Um, you know, certainly, certainly, at least here in the bowhead whales, we have we have slower dividing cells. But um, you know, sort of the you know one of the hypotheses back in the day. I don't know if it's how how much correlation there is. Is that you know you have lower metabolic rates, right? Correlate with higher higher lifespan. But if you have a lower division, is that is that not necessarily a lower metabolic rate, but you know, the cells are still metabolically active, even though they're not dividing, but that gives them more time to perform DNA repair as well. Um, I, do, I do find it somewhat fascinating how close in terms of doubling, population doublings, humans and whales were. I, I kind of assumed that yeah. they'd be wildly different, not almost identical. Do yeah, we know, we, are mouse, yeah. mice similar? Like, do mice have similar order of magnitude doublings before? They die. No, the cells me. Um, don't know. Something to look at. So, um, gonna have to go back and, and review and review some of the fundamentals here, which is rate of division. <laughs> um, I mean, cells develop. Yeah. Uh, I mean, between species, is is probably a publication that looks at that very readily. Um, so I should be able to pull, pull that up pretty quickly. Of course, division rate also varies wildly amongst human cells within within cells you have high turnover in intestinal sure. cells much much slower turnover in, in like liver and hepatocytes and of course almost no turnover in like neurons and and and, and muscle cells yeah. so um but across species if we look at the same cell types fibroblasts um uh yeah i i there probably is i would assume that the rate of division probably also scales so that and and I don't know if people have correlated that rate of division with um, with DNA repair. Maybe they have. That's something else to take a look at to see if there's a correlation between that versus just kind of saying that if they divide faster, that's you know they're undergoing higher rates of metabolism. But that's not always the case, right? Because like I said, if the cell's not dividing; yeah. it's still it's still burning glucose like crazy because it needs to maintain membrane polarity. It needs to it needs to do everything it needs to do, even Division is just one small part of, of, a, of a living cell, right? Yep. And can we conclude from this paper that having bowhead whale CIRBP inserted in our own cells would be good for us? And if so, how do we do that? Well, the authors kind of speculate in the end there. Um, let's see what they, you know, if we go back to the paper. Well, the, the figure... Figure five kind of suggests no because they, they do exactly that, right? Human fibroblasts with bowhead whale therapy B and they don't find a significant improvement. Yeah, but they um, that's true. It's so not 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 quite bowhead whales, but um, what did they mention here? Surprisingly, yeah, CRBP protein in bowhead whales, regardless whether cells are cultured 37, 33 or lower. Uh, suggesting consent. No temperature did human cells produce similarly higher, or though they did go up, I think, when they, they well, they increased NHEJ, which the, let's see, what did they mention? Uh, I think I'm in a discussion section here. Maybe we should take uh, cold water plunges. Yeah, that's, well, they mentioned this, uh, let's see, but did they actually measure CRBP? I'm not sure they said, okay, so here I'm looking at, to test whether hypothermia-mediated increase in human CRRBP can also affect double strand break. We kept human cells for two days at 33 before transfection, um, showed a two-fold increase in NHEJ efficiency, yes, but was there another paper that showed CIRBP levels of human goes up? Well, it certainly implies that if it's called cold inducible RNA binding protein, right? <laughs> um, so I think that's that was known in other other papers. Uh, it's in the discussion here. It gets, when one of these things says uh, NHEJ efficiency or HR efficiency, what what is the uh, units of that efficiency? It's just like Speed of repair, number of repairs. I, I think that means um, efficiency in uh, this case is 
Um, so it, 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 it depends. Um, if you're measuring, let's say, uh, so precision of repair, right? So if, if GFP is, if they're using a GFP reporter and the GFP functionality is regained, um, that's, that's the efficiency that they're measuring. So, yeah. I wonder why this feels like figure four and figure five contradict each other. This figure four shows human fibroblast, if I understand this correctly, human fibroblasts with bowhead whale, Kirby B, and the efficiency doubled or more. And then in the next figure, figure five, they show that. Wait, 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 wait. which fi fi figure five? Sorry. Figure four, what? Uh, figure, figure four, so figure B four. and C. Okay. They show a significant increase when you have bowhead whale, Kirby B, in human fibroblasts, right? Mm -hmm. Like the, the white versus the blue. And so, yes. okay, great. So bowhead whale, Kirby B, in human cells, everything's, everything's good. But then if you go down to figure five and we look at the C there, mm -hmm. adding bowhead whale, Kirby B, doesn't seem to do anything. Like, it seems. Oh, um, am I misunderstanding this? Well, it. Uh, well, there's well, there there are two two different uh, okay. There's there's there are two different assays here. Um, right. So this is this is looking at an endogenous P10 locus. They do say that there is a significant difference in yeah, you know, it's in, compared to the other bar that was like two to three times the efficiency, and if efficiency means less mistakes, then you'd expect that to show up in this chart amazingly well yeah um i'd have to read that a little bit more deeper it, it is a different assay um i mean it's a completely different assay so i'm not really sure how i see your point but it's 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 hard uh it's hard i was to, wondering yeah. what what does efficiency mean here maybe i'm just not understanding what efficiency is in this context I, initially when we were reading this I, I thought that meant what you described which is yeah, it, uh, more yeah. reliable. Well, the efficiency is the amount of the, the amount of GFP po the ratio of GFP positive to to so all of the cells basically get so you have a whole bunch of red cells. So every cell is red, right? Um, mm -hmm. Because so the it, so so this is transformation efficiency. So you're looking at cells that have taken up both um, both both reporters, right? So so you're looking at the ratio of cells that are both GFP positive and also are RFP positive. So if the cells, uh, you know, if, if, um, if there are no GFP positive cells, then the efficiency is zero. If they're all GFP positive, then, then it's one. So it's basically looking at a conversion of the GFP null cells back to a GFP positive. So that's essentially what they're, what they're looking at here. Um, it, could be there could be a point mutation still in the GFP positive cells, right? That's not being accounted for. It's just the fact that they're glowing green uh, means that you had right. that level of efficiency of repair. So it's not. So for, yeah. For that to be the case, then it would mean that even though we had very similar rates of mutations, the mutations were in places that were less impactful, which feels like a far-fetched hypothesis. Well, you're, you, I mean, you're, you're, if you're doing non-homologous end joining and you have insertions and deletions, then you're, you're not going to recapitulate a, a, a green fluorescent protein that works. Uh, if you probably are off by, you know, if you're off by a point mutation that's not a multiple of three, then, then you're also going to screw up the GFP gene. So if you, so it's, it's only a very limited amount of mutations that you can really kind of put into this system before you're not going to pick up a GFP positive cell. Yeah, that's what I would expect as well. It just it, it just seems to contradict that next figure is all, and I'm trying trying to reconcile that. Like that next figure just suggests that there was very little benefit to bowhead whale Kirby B in human cells, and uh, yet the yeah. previous figure shows the huge benefit, like two x efficiency. It's, it's big. And I don't know which which figure to believe. Do we get 2x efficiency when you put bowhead whale Kirby B into humans, or do you get, get meh improvements in reliability? Yeah, I don't know. Um,
Yeah, it's it's a little it's it's a little difficult to, to reconcile that just because you you have you have the repair enzymes working on plasmids that are freely floating versus a chromosomal location that's also has it's wrapped around nucleosomes and it's compacted and oh. might require additional factors. So it's like an apples and oranges. I see. It's, it's hard for me to. I see. Okay, know. I think that's what I was missing. Yeah. This this is uh, it's on a chromosome. Yeah. This is on the chromosome. The other yeah. one is just free some, some plasmids, yes. Yes. Some DNA circles, and that's it. So RPB is a really good job of fixing yeah. breaks in just little plasmids. But it seems to, go ahead, well, RPB in humans at least, doesn't seem to have nearly as big of an effect on fixing our chromosome. Unless you throw in some additional factors, maybe maybe you also need more RPA. Maybe you also need other 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 factors that help unwind the chromos uh, the chromatin, and then and then then bowhead will Kirby P would be acting as like gangbusters. Right. So it's like I like that's what I was trying. <clears throat> what I was mentioning apples and oranges. The the um the DNA yeah, okay. context is different. So <clears throat> so they get so qualitatively, you could say, yeah, they're. Adding in more Kirby P increases efficiency in both cases, and then, then, then to your point, wait, but it's you know it's twofold more there, and, and we're seeing the slight effect here. And, but then you also have the context of, of of chromatin DNA versus versus plasmid. So you know one one could be much more yep. access, accessible, and the other one might require additional factors. I'm being a little hand wavy here, but that's because I, yep. I really don't know. There might be there might be additional. Stuff so to answer it. John's question, uh, yeah, just bowhead whale Kirby B in your cells, it's probably not going to help your chromosomal DNA repair much. But plunging into even cold if you plunging into cold water might help. <laughs> uh, plunging and, and, and staying. <laughs> they, they, they did what was it three days um, of 33 degrees in this I'm essay? Yeah, I don't. Uh, uh, well, you might might need. Maybe need shorter. Um, hopefully, uh, Maybe. You'd, be, you'd be dead. <laughs> well, it was three days. Three days in cell culture, but it might only mean three minutes in, in real life. So, yeah, essentially. So the right. key is, I think, be cold when your cells are doing DNA repair. <laughs> yes, um, and being cold might actually help DNA repair. Um, so they mention. Let's go to the discussion. What was this discussion? Where is the discussion? Which is ironically. Uh, Kind of unfortunate because, uh, at least from breaks due to UV exposure, you're most likely hot, not cold. Like the time when you need your DNA repair to be functioning well is the time when you're most likely to be hot. Yeah. So there is a there is another interesting question on temperature, which is if the ATPO efficiency of the cell is lower, one would assume that the efficiency is lower because it generates more heat. So you probably have a slightly warmer cell if your mitochondria are less efficient. So that, that in itself may have a small difference. I don't think it's going to be a big difference, but it's an interesting point. Mm. So, yeah, to add further to, to your question, John, um, Still, the mechanisms are unknown, which the authors mention here. While molecular mechanisms responsible for the beneficial effects of cryotherapy are largely unknown, we speculate that increased Kirby P expression may contribute to health benefits by facilitating DNA repair. Uh, whether or not that's the case, uh, don't know yet. But uh, you know, it's certainly the authors certainly speculate on that, and, and further experiments need to be done. Um, I think I think what we can conclude here, though, is that. Um, bowhead whale double-stranded break DNA repair efficiency when it comes to repairing them without adding in really kind of these giant chunks of aberrant insertions and deletions. Um, it's much better in bowhead whales, um, which are extremely long-lived. Now, whether or not that is one of the key drivers for the longevity of the bowhead whale, I think that's still inconclusive. Uh, it's very tantalizing. Certainly, it meshes with the earlier paper that we we read, where you have a strong correlation between rate of somatic, you know, rates of somatic mutations taking place, and a decrease in insertions and deletions, you know, in in, in long-lived organisms versus short-lived organisms. So that certainly ties into that. Um, but I think you know, uh, further experiments need to be done to see whether or not boosting those repair capabilities will lead to an extension. Of, of maximal lifespan in short-lived organisms, um, or if we can come up with good proxies in tissue culture to basically to basically measure this. Um, I certainly think that's the case. 
um, you know, but we need, we need further experiments. And certainly other people do, otherwise people wouldn't be wasting their time doing these experiments. Um, uh, but I do think that's, that's part of the entropic puzzle, if you will. You know, I think that's maybe not the entire um, driver for, you know, for, for aging in, in, in many organisms, but I think it's, it's probably a key driver, which is, which is um, uh, mutation rate um, within various loci in, in DNA. And, well, you, uh, you yeah. commented on um, experiments in short-lived organisms, but it's certainly possible that this factor is more important in long-lived organisms and that maybe we should look at other biomarkers in human tests and long-lived animal tests rather than just looking at short-lived organisms. Uh, are you talking about maybe looking at supercentenarians and seeing if they have better versions or maybe higher intrinsic levels of CIRBP or other enhanced capabilities for DNA repair? Well, no, I was thinking maybe um, we take some long-lived organism like a monkey and um, actually gene modify it and see whether some of the biomarkers of aging have improved or if we have some very experimental people who want mm. to self-modify themselves, um, see whether they change any biomarkers of aging. Yeah, well, certainly you could measure, you could measure like using, you know, tissue culture um, and see whether or not you have efficiency of somatic mutation repair increase, right? Um, the corollary to that, which is, does that now mean you have extended maximal lifespan? Um, or a decreased rate of aging is obviously, you know, for obvious reasons, temporal reasons, harder to track, right? Uh, but you can certainly start out with, you know, um, you know, testing out systems to see if if you can if you can boost the efficiency of repair, um, and then figuring out ways to, um, you know, that would be easier to do relatively than than you know than the, than the um, and the corollary to see if that ties into, you know, um, decreased rate of aging as well as an increased um, maximal longevity. Uh, probably have to come up with better. You know, the obvious the obvious answers to that is is to put all these systems into short lived animals and see if that increases their maximal longevity. Um, but I'm thinking, if, you know, I'm, I'm thinking along the lines of also. Um, as an intermediary, if we can come up with, for humans at least, cell-based systems to more accurately measure rates of aging, therapeutics that can increase the, you know, decrease the rate of aging, increase maximal longevity, you know, if there's novel systems that we can configure, you know, people talk about organs on a chip, for example, using IPS cell technology to recapitulate, you know, humans on a on a you know, much more complex scale when they do drug assays, for example, whether or not something like that could be developed for, you know, for um, uh, anti-aging therapeutics as well as, as well as more kind of radical ways to, you know, improve the, you know, improve the longevity of cells and see if we can, if we can come up with like a, you know, a virtual kind of, human system, right? Humanoid system that we could say that, that, that this has got a much more positive chance of, of, of working in, in a, um, you know, in a human. Uh, so that's something to think about. I don't think, um, you know, to, to come up with, with, a, with a, with an in vitro system that's complex enough that can, that can, that can recapitulate all or most, um, facets of aging and longevity. Um, that we can then directly translate those findings um, uh, to humans. I don't have the answer right now, but I will think about it. <laughs> and I, I'm sure most of us that are listening, or at least some of us will be thinking about that as well. Um, well, that's all I have for everybody. I know some people are peeling off. Uh, they have other commitments and meetings. It is 1.54 p.m. over here, so... Um, We've been gabbing for almost two hours on this paper, um, and uh, and I think uh, I think I, I like this. I like these types of papers which really try to home in on the fundamental mechanisms and drivers of aging, as well as the the flip side to that, the fundamental drivers of longevity. Uh, as I've mentioned before, you know, 
aging to me is, you know, fundamentally uh, a problem of physics, you know, things break down, but the mechanisms that systems have evolved to combat that, you know, these drivers of longevity, that's what interests me as a biologist. And this paper here is trying to get at one of these drivers of longevity um, reportedly, which is enhanced efficiency of DNA repair. So um, thank you everybody for joining me and uh, we will try and find another exciting cutting edge paper for next month as well. And don't forget EARD, if you're in town, Ending Aging Related Diseases, August 10th and 11th uh, here in New York City. Uh, it's going to be a great lineup of folks. Um, Dr. Vadim Gladyshev, who's a co-author on this paper, will be present there. So um, I don't know how we're going to be running it, the show virtually. Maybe we'll be able to jump, pipe in some questions, or maybe you can send me some questions because I'll be seeing Vadim, and maybe I can ask him about uh, specifics on this paper. Or by then, we've probably moved on to two other papers, and you've forgotten about this paper. And <laughs> additional questions for you know for other researchers. I don't know. Thanks, Oliver. I'm, I'm actually planning to make it to New York for this one. In the past, I've only been virtual. Oh, great. Fantastic. Looking forward to seeing you and everybody else there. Right. And uh, if you want to know more about the conference, uh, visit lifespan.io forward slash conference. It's that simple. Although you can't miss it if you just go to the home page. So I'll be mortified if anybody could actually not know about it by visiting their site but you can get there directly on that link um as i say there's three more days of the early bird uh, physical conference lower price tickets uh, so if you're coming in person now's the time the time is nigh as they say yep so there you go i won't be joining you this year i'll be virtually there though uh, unfortunately um but yeah It'll be cool either way, so uh, I'm excited. We've got lots of cool, uh, cool speakers lined up, so uh, check it out. Anyway, all right, that's it. Finish my pitch. Okay. Well, thanks everybody. Thank you, Oliver. And all right. uh, yeah, and I appreciate all the questions that we get from all of our participants here uh, live. It, uh, it's kind of one of the. It what makes this a journal club rather than a lecture, right? So I, I like this back and forth of ideas, and and we record all of these. So any ideas we get, um, we can share with the world. So. Do we have an estimate of how many people watch this on Zoom, either live or later? Do you know? Steve? Um, well, not off the top of my head, um, because what happens is it actually goes off and gets put on uh, YouTube as well. And it also then goes out to uh, the website as well. And of course, people can watch it on here. Um, sorry, Dev. Uh, so the, the, the short answer is, I don't know. The long answer is, I don't know, but I could probably find out and let you know. But a lot. That's the thing. It's like not everybody can make it in the day and watch it live. But it journal clubs do tend to accrue lots of views, um, you know, over the coming weeks, which is cool. So I guess that means that Oliver is an influencer. <laughs> That's right. Yeah, I guess. <laughs> I, I, well, okay. Where, where it matters, <laughs> right? So you know. So I'm not. I'm, I'm hopefully influencing the science and not my wardrobe. Oh, chatty. <clears throat> You're not in the wardrobe, are you today? I mean, I did wonder. <laughs> Okay. Well, before I say say anything in say anything inappropriate, I think I'm going to sign off. <laughs> I know what you're thinking, and uh, yes, let's go. Okay, everybody. See you all later. See you all later.